Welcome back to Skeptics in the Pub Online. This is Brian Eggle here. This is our first talk of 2022, hopefully. But it's event number 74 since we started back in April 2020 as a response to the pandemic. And we've been going, both been going strong ever since. And while SARS-CoV-2 brings you a barrage of awful symptoms, up to and including death, Skeptics in the Pub Online brings you regular doses of science, reason and critical thinking. Just the type of inoculation you need against the constant stream of misinformation that is being sprayed at you. We are offering you a vital booster every second and fourth Thursday of the month, so keep an eye out in the usual places for announcements and updates. We also offer you a friendly community to interact with. In the chat area on Twitch, in our Zoom pub, the Lock-In's Razor, after tonight's talk, on our Discord server, and all of the usual social media jiggery-pokery. So please get involved. All of the above cost you literally nothing, but if you do have any pennies to spare, you can help keep us running by making a, a donation. Our mods will be putting the link into the text chat for that. You can also buy some merch. If you're short on cash, maybe because you're saving it to buy our speaker's latest book, then maybe you can help us just by spreading the word on social media and such like. You know, just say nice things about us. So here's how things are going to roll this evening. Our speaker's going to kick off shortly with a 40-ish minute talk. Then we take a break, after which we reconvene for Q&A. And that is where you come in, folks. Please post your questions in Slido. Again, the mods will put the link in text chat for you. You can also upvote other questions so the more popular ones have a better chance of being asked. So, our speaker for this evening wins the record for the surname that sounds most like a symptom of Bell's palsy. Laurie Winkless is a physicist and author. After a physics degree and a master's in space science, she joined the UK's National Physical Laboratory as a research scientist specialising in functional materials. Now based in New Zealand, yes, she got up early just for us, Laurie has been communicating science to the public for 15 years. Since leaving the lab, she's worked with scientific institutes, engineering companies, universities and astronauts, amongst others. Her writing is featured in outlets including Forbes, Wired and Esquire. And she appeared in the Times magazine as a leading light in STEM. Of course, speaking for us is without a doubt the pinnacle of that glittering career. Her first book was cheekily named Science in the City. And her new book, Sticky, The Secret Science of Surfaces, is available now. And those of you available in the UK can get a sweet, sweet 25% discount when purchasing it. Again, the mods will put the links and the code for that into the text chat. I just finished the audiobook myself and can highly recommend it. She's going to have you glued to your seats for the rest of the evening, guaranteed. Laurie, over to you. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's really nice to be here, guys. Uh, thank you, guys and gals, of course, and everyone in between. Um, it's lovely to be here. I used to go to a lot of Skeptics events when I lived in London, so it feels really nice to actually be able to join in, even though I am in New Zealand. So it's already Friday morning here, so I'm saying hello from the future. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm kind of ostensibly here to, to plug my new book, Sticky, and I will share the discount code at the end as well, so keep an eye on that too. Um, but really, I want to talk to you about my favourite topic, which is friction, and to introduce you to just some of the ways in which our understanding of friction has allowed us to, to build the world as we see it. So the first thing I'm going to do is my kind of natural plug of the book. Um, so this is what the book looks like, and I won't stay in this for too long, but just to give you an idea of the topics that I cover, there are probably some of the obvious ones. So the first chapter is all about adhesives and paints and non-stick surfaces. Then I dedicate a whole chapter to the gecko, you know, I would say the best, most interesting climber that has ever evolved. I do a chapter on hydrodynamics, so the forces involved in moving through water, and then a, a chapter on the forces involved in moving through air, aerodynamics. The fifth chapter is mostly about Formula One, of which I'm a really big fan. And it's in that chapter, really, what I'm talking about is grip. I'm talking about tyres and brakes. And living in New Zealand, of course, I have access to a lot of incredible earthquake scientists and geologists. So I've given a chapter to that topic, too, because friction is really important. 
I also talk about ice, the human sense of touch, and then in the final of the nine kind of main chapters, we delve into the atomic realm to really try to understand what friction is fundamentally. But for the purposes of today's talk, I didn't really, you know, want to bring you on any one of these chapters. It didn't feel right. And what I really wanted to do instead was to try and give you an overview. Um, really, I want to convince you that humanity's relationship with surfaces and the forces that act between interfaces, that has been f absolutely fundamental to the way that we move through the world and to the shape of the world as we know it today. So we're starting here with ancient rock art. Now, rock art like this will adorn sites in different pockets of the world, um, usually in caves or in sheltered walls or overhangs. And the one that you're looking at here is fairly typical of, it's called a Guion motif, um, created by the Guion people in northern Kimberley region of Australia. So not so far from me, still pretty far, <laughs> but not so far. Um, and this this particular piece that you're looking at at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, has been dated at 12,000 years old. And that's not even that old. In other parts of Australia, in the Northern Territory, for example, there are samples of rock art that have been dated at 28,000 years old. Outside Australia, we have even older examples. Um, on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi, there's a particularly famous rock art site amongst many on the island. One shows a, a buffalo or a bison type animal being hunted by human-like figures. And that's been dated at 44,000 years old. So that's just after the last ice age. And there's even a hand stencil in a cave in Spain that some archaeologists believe was created by a Neanderthal and has been dated at approximately 62 to 64,000 years old. Now, we've only had the ability to scientifically age sites like this for a few decades. And even now, there are still loads of unknowns. You know, we still don't fully understand what many of these paints are made from, or really why they've stuck around for as long as they have. Of course, I should say that sites like this also transcend any scientific value that we can ascribe to them. You know, they give us a glimpse um, at the lives of our ancestors, at the things that they saw and the things that they dreamed of, the things that they were afraid of or, or that they loved. So these sites are incredibly precious. But as we've seen in recent years, that they're not always treated as such. These sites also have an, a scientific value too, but to me, they really demonstrate that our relationship with surfaces is not new, right? We have been figuratively and literally making our mark on surfaces since the dawn of humanity. And as an even more recent but still pretty ancient example will show you, for millennia, we have also been actively manipulating surfaces, so deliberately altering their properties to make them behave differently. So now we have swooped over to Egypt. Um, you are currently looking at a wall in the tomb of Jehuti Hotep. This is in Dar el Barsha in what's called what was called Middle Egypt. Now Jehuti Hotep wasn't a pharaoh. He was a pretty wealthy uh, provincial governor who lived around four thousand years ago, and. That wealth and that influence that he had gave him the means to build himself an astonishing tomb. Like this tomb has been hewn out of solid rock high up on a hill. Um, and it's been famous since it was rediscovered, you know, but, and it's mostly because of, as you can see, these really detailed images on the wall. Like this cave, the, this tomb, excuse me, has been through the ringer, right? We've had, there have been earthquakes that have caused damage. There's been vandalism that has caused damage. And there's been quarrying activity that has literally made bits of it fall apart. And yet, even amongst all this damage, you can still see these really beautifully adorned images on the wall. And that is what has made this tomb as famous as it is. And there is one particularly famous mural, which is this one that I'm just highlighting now. This mural has been dubbed the Transport of the Colossus, and I want us to take a bit of a closer look at it. 
So now here you can see a reproduction of the mural, and this was created by an Egyptian artist working with the community there. And you can see that it depicts this huge stone statue sitting atop a sled. And if we are to believe the scale of this, and you look at the humans who are dragging the sled along by a series of ropes, this truly is enormous. And it is believed to represent Jehutihotep himself. So, as I said, influential and very wealthy. But amongst all the busyness on this image that you can see, I just want you to focus on one individual. And it's this person down here. You can see him standing at the foot of the statue at the front of the sled. Now, he is pouring a liquid from a vessel directly in front of the sled. And when these images were first rediscovered, this was initially interpreted as a ceremonial act. You know, perhaps this was an oil or some sort of cleansing balm or some sort of blessing that this person was applying to the sand, a way to kind of cleanse the path that this statue would take en route to its final destination. But in the years that followed, there have been a number of engineers who've wondered if there might be something more to this. Like, could this liquid actually have been an early lubricant? Could this have been used as a way to make it easier to slide the incredibly heavy sled on the sand? So in 2014, some researchers set out to test this idea by recreating the situation in miniature. Now, the idea of the experiment was pretty simple, right? They made a small sled with rounded edges, which were similar to what we saw on the mural, and they loaded it up with weights. Now, I would be the first one to admit here that I feel like there was a real missed opportunity and they could have made weights in the shape of a tiny version of the Jehuti Hotep statue, but they did not. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they pulled this weighted sled along samples of three different types of sand. Now, some of the sand was monodisperse, and by that I mean the grain size was pretty standard across the whole sample. And some of the samples were polydisperse, and this is much more like real desert sand. We see grains of lots of different sizes. In the experiment, they could also mix the different samples of sand with varying quantities of water. And all the while, they would measure the forces involved in pulling this sled along the sand samples. And a key thing to mention here is that this experiment was designed so that they scaled everything um, to make it match up with the Jehuti Hotep situation as much as they possibly could. So archaeologists had previously estimated that the force of this statue, assuming it was solid stone, um, it would have exerted a force of about one tonne per square metre onto the sand. So that's 10,000 pascals. And the pascal, if you don't know, is a unit of pressure. Now, in this experiment, they took a 20 Newton mass and it was spread over an area of about 80 centimetres squared. So you're getting to 2,500 pascals. So it's not precisely the same, but it is the same order of magnitude, which allows them to kind of directly compare their results to what we see in the Jehuti Hotep mural. Now, the thing that they, the metric really that they were most interested in is something called the coefficient of friction, right? And the coefficient of friction, or mu, is a ratio that tells you something about how two material surfaces will interact with each other. So, more specifically, mu is the ratio of the friction force that resists motion between surfaces and the normal force or the supportive force that a, surf that a surface will exert on an object sitting on it. And this number is used a lot in engineering and physics. Now you can determine a value of mu that is between two stationary objects, in which case we think of it as the static coefficient of friction, or between two sliding objects, which is the dynamic coefficient. And, and that's really what we were interested in in this particular experiment. But regardless of whether it's static or dynamic, usually the closer the value of mu is to zero, the more easily these two surfaces will be able to slide along one another. And by measuring the forces involved in the sled being pulled along this kind of increasingly wet sand, these scientists could track that coefficient of friction and they could therefore directly determine what impact, if any, that adding water would have on the sand's 
slipperiness, for want of a better word. Now, no matter what sand sample they used, if the sand was dry, the coefficient of friction they measured was high. About 0.55 was fairly typical. And they attributed this to the formation of a little heap of sand in front of the sled. Um, as they started to pull the sled, this heap of sand would form, making it harder for the sled to get moving. And you can see that, right? I drew this beautifully, this beautiful schematic for you. <laughs> But you can also see it on this graph. And yes, there will be graphs in this um, talk, I'm afraid. I think there's three, maybe four. Um, but you can see this if you look at the red curve on this graph. You can kind of physically see the impact of this formation of this little heap of, of sand. But as they gradually increased the water content in the sand, the size of that heap began to decrease and it eventually disappeared, which made it easier for the sled to move. So in terms of mu, so in terms of our coefficient of friction, the friction between the sled and the desert sand, so this is the polydisperse sand, dropped by 40% when just a small volume of water, 5% volume water, was added to the sand. Now, here's another graph. Um, so you can actually see this here. Um, you see that mu is on the left-hand side, so that's the coefficient of friction. And if you look at the purple line, that's what's isosand, that's the polydispersed sand that they used here. And you can actually see that mu can drop down to a value of about 0 0.3 when 5% water was added. So that's really interesting. But this curve also tells you that if you keep adding water, the friction begins to rise again. So anything beyond about 5% water, you, it then gets harder to move the sled again. So that really suggests that in terms of transporting objects on sand, there is an optimal value, there's an optimum value or a volume of water that you can add that will help you to do that, that will aid in that sliding. And usually, well, what they've measured in this experiment, it was about 70% easier to start something sliding on damp sand than on dry. So it's a significant difference. And in a separate study completely unrelated to this, but again based on really detailed murals at different sites in Egyptian tombs, archaeologists who were interested in ropes, uh, they looked at the maximum pulling strength that ropes at the time would have been able to sustain. And based on that, they reckon that certain statues, including the Jehuti Hotep one, could only have been dragged along by ropes, which is what we saw in the mural, if the coefficient of friction between the statue or the sled, really, between the sled and the desert sand was around 0 0.33. So pretty much bang on to these results here, which suggests that the ancient Egyptians knew something about the concept of lubrication. So in this instance, they understood that if they added a certain amount of water to the sand, if they slightly dampened the sand, they could move the same object with around half the amount of effort. Now, lubrication is something that has become very commonplace for us, but it wasn't just the ancient Egyptians who first started using it. Contemporaneously with Jehuti Hotep, um, and for many, many centuries afterwards, there are lots of examples, both in the literature and in um, different other archaeological records, of other compounds being used as lubricants. So we saw things like natural soaps, um, like lime powder, uh, a byproduct of the olive oil industry, as it were, uh, which is called amurca, that was heavily used, animal fats. We see evidence of these compounds being put onto places like the axles of chariot wheels or the rudders of boats. Um, and the goal of adding those compounds was really to reduce the friction between them and the bearings that house them, so to make things easier to move. And in the Industrial Revolution, the kind of 18th and 19th century, that's really when lubrication and lubricant products started to become a real thing, right? Initially, they were designed really just to kind of physically separate two rubbing or rotating surfaces from one another. So to give those two moving surfaces something easier, something lower friction on which to slide. 
And you would see at this time mill owners and engineers who would develop their own recipes, right? They would develop their own blends of different mineral oils, usually something that would give them the kind of correct consistency and behavior for their specific needs. And lubrication, I would argue, was also vitally important, played a massive role in the development of the railways. So this man that you can see here, um, his name is Elijah McCoy. And in 1872, he invented a lubricator that automatically and continuously distributed an oil-based lubricant through the moving components of a railway engine. And in practical terms, that meant that locomotives required fewer and shorter maintenance stoppages. You know, these trains could keep going for longer because the contacts within them were nicely lubricated. And that had a huge impact on the efficiency and the reliability of both freight and passenger services. And it really made the railways the go-to transport option for that period. And as someone who loves trains and anything to do with railway infrastructure, I feel like we owe a huge debt to inventors like McCoy. As you might imagine, over time, lubricants have gotten considerably more complex and more specialised, and our approach to making them has gotten somewhat more scientific. Um, as well as managing friction, now the right lubricant is used for a whole host of reasons. So the right lubricant could be a very useful thermal sink, for example. It can carry away some of the heat that builds up between two objects sliding along one another. Lubricants can also act as a corrosion barrier. You know, they can protect metal surfaces from moisture and oxygen in the air, which reduces the risk of, of rusting. And eventually, if rust is allowed to continue, it causes catastrophic breakdown in parts. So it, it helps pieces and components to last longer. I should say, though, that not all lubricants are these kind of gloopy liquids that we think of. Um, solid materials, including graphite, are very important and very widely used. And um, probably if you have a mechanical lock somewhere in your life, uh, there's probably some graphite in there being used as a lubricant. Um, there are also other solid lubricants. So I've just given you one example here, which is molybdenum disulfide. And you can see it kind of looks a bit like graphite. Uh, in many ways, it is quite similar. It is this 2D layered material. So on the atomic level, you know, layers of these atoms can kind of slide and move along one another. But molybdenum disulfide doesn't do so well in oxygen-rich environments. It does particularly well in oxygen-free environments and at very low temperatures, which is why it's increasingly used in the space industry. So like many other objects and crafts and rovers that we have launched from Earth, the Perseverance rover, which is one of my personal favourites, um, and which is currently pootling around on Mars, it uses molybdenum disulfide in many components within its mechanical systems. Lubrication's job really is to keep things moving, right? Without these products, most machines would literally grind to a halt and things would break down and wear down much more frequently. The global market for lubricating compounds, and this was something I almost couldn't believe, but I have verified several times, it was in excess of £107 billion in 2020. Now, that is about the same size as the global market for computer games across all platforms. So reducing friction is big, big business. But we don't always want to minimise friction. There are lots of times in which we need to maximise it. Now, tyres are my personal favourite example of where our knowledge of materials has allowed us to use friction to our advantage. The very first wheels used for transport were made from wood and early tyres were really nothing more than a strip of leather or maybe like a, a metal ring that would be hammered into place around the wooden frame of the wheel. Now, these tyres, they might have provided some grip on rough roads, but really their job was to act kind of as a sacrificial layer, right, to, to protect the wheel structure, um, absorb some of the energy that would be involved in rattling along the road. But it was something that could be easily replaced if it got damaged without having to rebuild the whole wheel. 
The addition of kind of black rubber tyres, the invention of that came much later. Now, natural rubber, and someone asked me about this the other day, kind of someone thought that it was just something we made up. (laughs) It really does exist. Um, It is produced by certain species of plants and and trees. Um, Natural rubber collected in this manner and, and being allowed to harden, that had been done and had been, and the material had been used for various purposes by the people of peoples of Mesoamerica, so this modern day Colombia, for centuries before any Europeans showed up on the shores, um, probably as early as 3,000 years ago. But this material wasn't particularly robust, right? Once it gets really hot, natural rubber will melt and it will become a liquid once more. So it's not particularly robust. But in the 1800s, kind of mid-1800s, there was an invention that changed that. And this was the invention of a process called vulcanization, which basically involves adding sulfur to natural rubber. There's a bit more to it than that. But what it actually, what the outcome of it is that cross links form between the compound within the rubber. So it produces a still kind of rubbery, somewhat flexible material, but it's one that is much more rigid and more durable at elevated temperatures. And the invention of vulcanization is what kickstarted the rubber industry. And within about 40 years of, of that being invented, tires, rubber tires as we know them, were being used on the very first car, so the Benz patent motor wagon. Modern tire rubber, some you know, modern tires do contain some natural rubber, right? But it's an increasingly small amount. Most tires are made with a rubber that's a, a blend of different synthetic polymers, and all of those have been produced from fossil fuels, um, plus some other additives. And tire rubber is a very interesting and slightly weird material because of the way it behaves. It behaves somewhere between an elastic solid and a very sticky or very viscous fluid. So if you think of an elastic solid as a spring, that's a good example. When you apply a squeezing force to a spring, it compresses, right? And then when you release the squeezing force, it bounces back immediately and retains its original shape. Now, if you try to compress a sticky fluid like an oil or a honey, you're going to do something, you're going to see something different. You're going to lose some energy. So I'm going to just, I need to escape out of here because... um, well, Skype's being a pain. So I'm just going to show you a very quick video that tells you how different a viscous fluid is. So it's this one. So if you look at the one on the right hand side, that is a very viscous fluid. And you can see the difference as the ball moves through that liquid. The ball moves much, much more slowly. So Let's go back in here. And what is really happening there is that in a viscous, in any viscous fluid, and I'm I'm including stuff like honey, right? In any viscous fluid, what really defines it as viscous is the forces that act between the molecules that make up that liquid. So there's a lot of internal friction in viscous fluids. And what that means is that as you try to squeeze it, or in this experiment here, pass a ball through it, you lose a lot of energy to those internal molecular interactions. And the output of that is that there is a delay between you applying a force to a liquid like this and the, and the liquid responding to that force. Now, tire rubber sits smack in between these two domains. It is viscoelastic. And as long as it's operating within its limits, rubber will deform and return to its original shape, like a spring, but it will do it with a bit of a time delay and some energy loss, like a viscous fluid. And this viscoelasticity is the key property that allows tyres to do what they do. So rubber, the rubber's ability, I suppose, to, to generate high amounts of friction be, with other surfaces is, is why we use it so widely. It's why we have it on the soles of our shoes. It's why athletics tracks are built with tiny bits of rubber embedded into them. Um, and of course, it's why we have rubber tyres on all our vehicles, including Formula One cars. Because perhaps surprisingly and maybe counterintuitively, without friction, we would struggle to get anywhere. 
Now, rubber generates friction by two main means. The first one, as a tyre rolls along a road, it interacts with the surface. Now, even on a racetrack, which is, you know, very tightly engineered and, and really smooth, deliberately so, on the micro scale, it's still pretty rough and heavily textured. So as a tyre is rolling along that road, the rubber deforms and it slips and flows over each one of these tiny bumps and rough spots. And because the rubber is viscoelastic, it kind of lingers in place. It kind of holds on to each one of these bumps ever so briefly. But that is enough to generate a resistive force, a friction force between it and the road. And this process by which the road surface kind of penetrates into the rubber, and that's known as indentation. And it's the main means by which most normal tyres, like, you know, a normal car or a bike tyre, um, will get its grip. But Formula One cars, thanks to their enormous and usually very smooth rubber tyres, they can tap into an additional form of grip. And it's usually referred to as molecular adhesion because it is sort of a temporary bond that forms between molecules of the tyre and the surface. For that to occur those two materials need to be in incredibly close contact. I mean, they need to be separated by no more than about one nanometer. And for scale, a single peppercorn measures about five million nanometers in diameter. So the contact between the tyre and the road is incredibly intimate. Now, it's, it's not a contact that we can see during the race, but we can see its effect. This form of adhesion can actually tear tiny bits of rubber off the surface of the tyre and it can leave them on the track. So if you've ever, if you watch Formula One and you've ever heard a Formula One commentator talking about laying down some rubber, that's precisely what they mean. Now, the benefit of this rubber layer is that it increases the grip further with each passing lap. And that's because the friction coefficient of rubber on rubber, so the tyre on this rubber layer, is higher than the coefficient of friction between rubber and asphalt. Now, the downside of it is kind of obvious too, because this process degrades the tyres. It's literally ripping the tyre apart, which is why you have to change tyres during a race. And of course, the strategy and tyre management part is a, is a big part of Formula One. So I'm not sure they'll change that anytime soon. Now, so far, I've kind of made it sound like friction is a binary, right? It's either on or it's off. Like we either need loads of it, like in a tire, or we are desperately trying to get rid of it as much of it as we can using lubricants. In reality, it's always a balance, right? You do want enough friction to allow you to do something, whatever it is you're trying to do, but not so much of it that you will instantly grind to a halt. So in most real in, in most versions of reality, you're balancing friction somewhere in the middle. But there are some examples in which friction literally flips between those two extremes. Now I am not a musician, um, but this is a violin, I can tell you that. <laughs> and like lots of stringed instruments, violins are played with a bow. Now, for many, many centuries, the, the bow hairs, the part of a bow that actually touches the strings, has been made from horsehair, like hundreds and hundreds of strands of horsehair that have been really tightly tensioned. And they produce this very strong and slightly rough surface. And when a violinist plays, they draw these bow hairs across the strings and that causes the strings to vibrate and generate sound. Right, that's violin playing 101 uh, from someone who doesn't do it. Um, but every violinist on the planet also relies on another material, one that you don't actually see when you're looking at this image. And this material is called rosin. And it is a solidified tree resin. It's made from a pine tree resin. And to, to kind of look after their bow, so they buy a brand new bow, um, a violinist will take a cake of rosin like this and they'll draw the bow through it, coating the strings. And they'll do that regularly with an older bow as well as kind of a maintenance. So it's really important and it has been used We've known about this as a compound since like the 6th century. It was used very heavily in, in medicine in the 6th and 7th century. 
it's not entirely clear, or at least I could not find, when rosin was first applied to bowed instruments. But I'm going to show you a video now that tells you just how incredibly important it is to, to producing the sound that we associate with a violin. So let me just escape out of here. One more video. This one. Okay, this one has sound, so hopefully you'll be able to listen. Just actually ordered this violin bow through Amazon. It has absolutely no rosin on it. And this is what you hear, or shall I say, you won't hear. And here's a bow I've been practicing with for a while. Um, and it does have rosin on it. So this is what it sounds like. So a big thank you to Dee for allowing me to show that video. Um, but what that really, what what's really happening here is that rosin can increase the static friction between two surfaces, right? So the usual explanation of this is that the rosin is making the bow hair more grippy, right? So as it moves across the strings, the strings kind of get excited in a, in a bigger way, so it generates larger vibrations and a richer sound. And rosin definitely does increase the static friction between surfaces. It's that that's why it's been used in as many ways as it has been. You know, we'll see weightlifters and Irish dancers, they'll apply a rosin based compound to the bottom of their shoes to minimize any unexpected slippage. Um, gymnasts and acrobats and pole dancers will do the same on their hands for the same reason. And there is actually an extra sticky version of rosin, like a very, very viscous version of rosin that's applied to the start line at drag races. And that allows those tyres to generate the kind of instantaneous grip that they need to, to leap forward from the line. But what's particularly interesting about the type of friction that, that rosin generates or grants to surfaces is that it actually turns out that when and we know this, we've measured this and we've seen this, as the strings of a violin vibrate beneath a rosined bow, they're actually continuously alternating between moving with the bow hairs. So they're, they're sticking to it, they're stuck to it because of rosin's ability to increase static friction and moving against the bow hairs, so slipping along it. So in one swipe of a violin bow, the strings will go through hundreds of these cycles of sticking and slipping. And it's actually the combination of those two mov movements that generate the really rich sound that you heard in Dee's video. Now, many sliding surfaces across all scales display this kind of intermittent motion and the stick-slip friction that's associated with it. And there's one example that I want to give you that I've become particularly interested in since moving to New Zealand. Of course, I'm going to talk about earthquakes. In the 1960s, there were two researchers called Brace and Byerly, and they did some experiments that really fundamentally shifted our understanding of earthquakes. The geologists knew then, and they still know, of course, um, that for eons, the relentless motion of the planet's tectonic plates cause huge stresses to accumulate in the crust. Now, at the time of Brace and Byerly's experiments, earthquakes were believed to signal that a piece of the crust had kind of reached its limits, right? It had, the rock was literally fracturing in response to these, this buildup of stress. But that model Although pretty good, and it did explain some observations, it didn't fully account for lots of the details. So, for example, how could stress build up in a rock that had previously that had been weakened by a previous earthquake, right? A previous fracture. This model also seriously overestimated how much the stress dropped or how much energy was released um, during a real earthquake. So it wasn't fully there. So in their experiments, what Brace and Byerly did, these are really now very standard experiments in earthquake geology. They took a solid, a solid cylinder of granite and they compressed it in all directions. So gradually increasing the stress as 
a piece of granite would experience within the crust. And they kept increasing the stress until it cracked. So a fault or a plane of weakness um, was created in the granite sample. Now, when this happened, when this crack formed, they measured a stress drop, which was kind of to be expected. And the fault, there was a a small bit of motion along that fault. So the two pieces of granite slid along one another. But once that settled down, they started squeezing the granite again. And they kept squeezing it until they measured another stress drop. But here you go, another graph for you. You can see the second stress drop was smaller than the first one. And interestingly, it didn't also correspond with the formation of a new fault. The only thing that happened was that the granite just slipped along the existing fault that had been generated in the first round. And the scientists kept up this cycle and found the stop-start motion just continued with decreasing stress drops all the way. And they found the same thing when they did the experiment with a sample that had been deliberately cut. You know, they kind of made a fault before the experiment started. Um, They found the same results in in very rough rocks and very smooth rocks. It just seemed that this jerky sliding behaviour, this stick-slip motion, was just kind of characteristic of how stressed rocks behaved. And and this decreasing decreasing stress release was the same. These days, earthquake fault motion is almost exclusively viewed in this way, right? It's frictional sliding along a fault plane. Now, in the real world, on a real fault, the periods of stick can be, you know, centuries decades, definitely centuries long in many cases, whereas the period of slip is very brief, uh, usually just a few seconds, or in the case of very big, very big earthquakes, uh, several minutes, because the slip period is when we feel the earthquake, right? It's when the ground literally moves, it physically moves, and that motion can be very significant. So the image in the background that you can see, um, I'll go back out so you can see it a bit more, and um, this was taken in 2016 um, after the Kaikoura quake. Now, Kaikoura is a in the, in the South Island of New Zealand, and this happened just before we arrived here. It was a very significant event, and it actually caused it kind of set off a chain of faults faulting. And um, but on one of the faults in the Kaikoura quake, um, the one part of the fault moved upwards by 10 meters and southward by six meters. So this this slip motion can be really, really significant. Now, over the decades, geologists have continued to deepen their understanding of earthquake mechanics, and they've done it through really sophisticated versions of these early lab experiments, um, really increasingly um, complex mathematical models and the invention of a whole heap, a whole heap of technologies that can measure even the tiniest deflections in the Earth's crust. We have literally never known more about earthquakes than we do right at this moment. But that's not to say that every mystery has been solved. For example, we still don't fully understand the mechanism behind so so-called slow slip events. Now, these happen a lot in New Zealand. And these are sometimes referred to as silent earthquakes because while they often release as much energy as a big earthquake, they don't do it over seconds and minutes. They do it over weeks and months. And they also don't produce the kind of traditional seismic signals that we associate with with earthquakes. So scientists in New Zealand are really working really, really hard to try to understand this. Um, This is Dr. Laura Wallace, and she has shown from her research that these slow slip events are incredibly important in accommodating the never ending motion between tectonic plates. They don't cause much damage, but they're definitely helping to kind of keep a lid on, on some of the massive stresses involved in these interactions. So Laura, she told me this herself, if we are ever to stand a chance of being able to forecast earthquakes, which which is not something we can do, and and no one I spoke to thinks that it's something we'll be able to do anytime soon. But if we are to stand any chance of doing that, it will be through understanding the interplay between all of these slightly odd um, events, these slow slip events and these bigger earthquakes, and trying to really delve down into what is going on where these two plates meet. Now, this idea, you know, I kind of thought that we knew an awful lot about earthquakes, and we do, like I said, right? But 
the fact that there are still so many mysteries around where what happens when two things meet was kind of surprising to me. And when I started researching the book, I knew there'd be topics that when I kept digging deeply, deeply enough, I'd eventually hit like a big question mark, a big, uh, we don't know. Um, and that's not that surprising because, you know, chasing after unanswered questions and trying to refine our understanding of stuff, that's that's science. That's why scientists do science. But something that happened kind of even more often than that, um, I would come across topics that humanity has been both like really interested in and impacted by for a very long time, but which we only fairly recently have begun to understand. So for the final couple of slides, um, I've just picked out one of these mysteries that I really liked, and it's a question related to ice. Let me just grab a drink. So like ice is a material we have always had to navigate and our ancestors came up with some really ingenious ways of managing it. There is some maybe questionable but some uh, archaeological evidence that in parts of Scandinavia our ancestors would use animal bones as kind of proto skate blades like gliders really to help them cross huge expanses of ice that existed in the region during the Bronze Age. And over time that really did develop into the skate blades that we see today. But for many of us, ice is just something that we kind of have to deal with. And we do so in very simple ways. You know, we we don our grippiest footwear. And if it's really cold and if we're in Canada or somewhere like that, we might uh, put snow chains on our tires and go about our daily life. But really, the goal of these things is to to increase anything, really, to increase the friction between us and the surface. And we do this because we instinctively know and understand that ice is slippery. The question is why? Now we know that part of the answer is that ice, like lots and lots of other solids, develop develops an extremely thin layer of it's quasi liquid, right? A thin layer of water that exists on its surface at temperatures that are far below its official melting point. And this is a very thin layer, like depending on the solid, it's between one and a hundred nanometers thick. And this is a process, this process of this formation of this liquid, it's called pre-melting. And we've known about it for like 60 years, maybe a bit longer. And a few years ago, Japanese scientists actually managed to see these atomically thin layers of water, quasi-liquid, um, using optical microscopes in the lab. But that didn't fully explain what's actually going on. Like where, why does this pre-melting layer form? So I want to introduce you to a bit of research from 2018 that I thought was really cool. Now in it, these scientists dragged a steel ball across ice surfaces that were at different temperatures. And materials wise, this is pretty similar to a skate blade moving across the ice. And they found some really cool stuff, right? So they found some things that are maybe obvious. Uh, they First of all, they confirmed that ice behaves differently at different temperatures. Okay, not that shocking. Here's another graph. I think this is the final graph. <laughs> but what they found was very unexpected, right? So looking at this graph now, you can see on the left-hand axis, you've got the friction coefficient, so mu, that we've talked about a few times. And then on the bottom, you've got temperature increasing. So going from minus 100 up to zero degrees C. And obviously above zero degrees C, we then get liquid, proper liquid water. So just looking at the green line for now, what the green line tells you is that at minus 100 degrees C, ice is actually a very high friction surface. So under the steel ball, it's not slippery at all. In fact, it's much closer to the interaction that you get between a steel ball and a very rough glass than the slippery ice surface that we tend to think of. But as the temperature of the ice is increasing, so following that green curve, you can see that friction is decreasing steadily and it actually reaches its lowest value at minus seven degrees C. So now from here, we need to flip to the blue line. So between minus seven degrees C and zero degrees C, you can see that line is, is almost vertical, right? That tells you that friction is increasing very sharply 
in that very narrow temperature range. Now, this is extremely weird, right? What is going on? What is happening at minus seven degrees C for this change, this sudden change in friction to occur? Well, on Earth, ice tends to take on this regular, it's highly regular crystalline structure. And it means that every water molecule in ice is surrounded by and bonded to four of its neighbours. On the surface of ice, it's slightly different um, because, you know, there are fewer of those molecules available. So molecules on the surface of ice can sometimes just be connected to three neighbours. And that difference means that those bonds on the surface, well, those molecules are have a little bit more energy. They can kind of wiggle around a bit. They're, they're still very much held in place, right? We're still well below freezing, um, but they can wiggle around a little bit. But what was interesting is when the scientists did the models to after they had kind of looked at, at these experimental results, what they realized is that Hidden amongst those triply bonded, slightly wobbly water ice molecules were some that were only bonded to two neighbours. And the difference in mobility between the triply bonded molecules and the doubly bonded molecules was enormous, right? The doubly bonded molecules weren't just sitting there wiggling around a bit. They were rolling around the surface of the ice like tiny ball bearings. And that that discovery of those doubly bonded molecules, that was the key to understanding why friction on ice was following this extremely odd trend. Because at minus 100 degrees C, almost all of the surface molecules were tightly bound to the rest of the ice. So what you had was a really hard, really high friction surface that scratching has little impact on. Rising temperatures would then give a little bit of energy to some of the surface molecules because they're the easiest to access, right? And that allowed some of them to kind of loosen their bonds a bit, like we said. That allows friction to decrease slightly because those surface molecules have a little bit of motion in them. But what the researchers, what Bon um, and his team, and actually I should say the two lead researchers are brothers, one's a chemist and one's a physicist, so that's hilarious. But anyway, um, what they found is that at minus seven degrees C, the majority of molecules on the surface of ice are actually mobile. So they're actually these doubly bonded molecules. So the surface of the ice is incredibly slippery because these doubly bonded molecules are rolling around like ball bearings. And as a bonus, that really high mobility of those molecules means that any scratches or damage that is caused by, you know, dragging the ball or uh, sliding a skate across the surface, that damage is kind of instantly repaired because these molecules are rolling around. So it smooths the ice, right? You get this lovely smooth surface. But the bulk of the ice at minus seven degrees is still really hard. It still retains its characteristic hardness. So you have this combination of a really hard, solid material with an incredibly low friction surface on the top. So in terms of skating, minus seven degrees C is like a sweet spot. And then what happens next is really that it's less about what's happening on the surface of the ice and more about what's happening in the bulk of the ice. So between minus seven and zero degrees C, as ice is approaching its melting temperature, the bulk of the ice starts to lose some of that hardness. It starts to soften up. So, which means that as a, as an object, a sli an object sliding on the surface, it doesn't really just slide on the surface anymore. It starts to dig into the bulk of the ice, and that's what causes this increase in friction. And that's the change, right? You've got a change from a material that can recover from deformation into one that can't. That's what causes that sudden transition. And we actually see the effect of this at the Winter Olympics, which is happening, if not now, like next week. Because um, remember, all of this is happening below freezing, right? It's all still ice. It's just that its properties hu change hugely. So if we look at speed skaters, long track speed skaters, they need very hard, very cold ice because they want to keep friction to a minimum. They want to go at high speeds and the speeds they can reach are kind of in excess of 50 kilometers an hour, right? These are fast. <laughs> but look at the temperature that this ice is at. And then with ice hockey, that's a game that's kind of characterized by explosive changes of pace, right? So they do also need a low friction surface, but they need enough friction so that they can change direction very suddenly. So their ice is slightly warmer 
and allows for that large, that kind of agile motion. And then you've got the figure skaters. Now, their goal really is, you know, a lot of what they do is leaping from the ice, doing these incredible turns and twists. And to do that, they need to get good purchase on the ice. They need to be able to dig their blades in so that they can leap. So to do that, they need a softer ice. And again, the temperature is lower. This is actually the warmest, softest ice of all the Olympic Games. And I guess you could probably argue, right, that this research paper that I told you about, it only confirmed something that winter athletes and professional ice makers have known about for a long time. But the reality is that observing or knowing that ice changes its behaviour at different temperatures isn't the same as understanding why that happens. And in science and engineering, to me anyway, why is kind of the most important question you can ask. Because if you're trying to, you know, if our goal is to to push the boundaries of our knowledge or like improve a process or to invent something new we need to understand the fundamentals of what's going on and right now as we are starting to make increasingly small devices and we're starting or continuing really to probe the atomic world we are starting to push the boundaries of what we understand about friction and I find that really exciting. So if you take away anything from this talk, I really hope it's that friction and surface science is not some freaking weird niche <laughs> topic that is only of interest to physicists and engineers. It's also not a dead and done um, area of science, as I was told when writing this book, because every new thing we discover about surfaces unveils a new mystery. These forces define so much of what we see around us that they have basically become almost invisible, right? We take them for granted. But as I hope you know, and we've seen through these slides, our knowledge of the forces that act on and between surfaces have been honed since time immemorial. And while the marks we've left on our planet have not always been good, right? You don't need me to tell you that. Um, the lessons that we have learned have allowed us to do amazing things. Like we have created art and music and we play sport. We can build engines and pyramids and we can fly even though we didn't need, we haven't evolved our own wings. We can harness energy from the wind and the waves and the sun and we can explore our solar system and beyond. Because surface science has and will continue to shape us. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And as promised, a reminder of the discount code if you wanted to buy my book. That's all. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so the questions are already coming in. Uh, please uh, throw, in, throw in some more folks during the break and upvote the ones you like the best. Um, there's been plenty of comments in the Twitch text awesome. chat as well. Lots of um, immature giggling about lube as well, which... Uh, quite frankly, Excellent. I'd like to encourage to the highest You're my degree. People. So, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, folks, we're going to take a break now um, to allow you to do some uh, hydrodynamics experiments, either by fetching a drink or going for a pee or maybe both. Just don't, don't cross the streams. Got a little challenge for you, though. Uh, inspired by the fact that I was listening to the, the latest Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes album this morning, because it's got the same name as Laurie's book. It's called <laughs> Sticky. So, um, I want to have uh, in the text chat and Twitch your sticky slash slippery band names or albums or songs that could be real ones. Uh, you know, since Laurie was talking about ancient rock art, we could talk about the Sticky Fingers album by the, the Rolling Stones or maybe things like Born Slippy by Underworld or the Cha Cha Slide. OK, so bonus points for for pun parody names as well in the text <laughs> chat. So if you don't have questions, get some banter in the text chat, please. So we're going to take a break now. We'll be back at 8.15 for your questions. Until then, uh, thank you, Laurie. Thanks. And we're back. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I see there's been some frantic interaction, both in Slido and in the Twitch chat uh, during the break there. So thank you for that. Just a few ones that you didn't get. I'll stick around by the Foo Fighters. Stuck with you by Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> Stick With You by the Pussycat Dolls, of course, and they're Stuck With You by Justin Bieber. And we have Roxy Music with Let's Stick Together, right? None of you got that, but we did get 
And by the way, Laurie, I don't know which of these are all real and which ones are parodies. You'll have to guess as we go along. Okay. Sticky Sticky by Spike Milligan. Slippery When Wet by Bon Jovi. Sliding Along in My Snowmobile. There's the New Order classic Glue Monday. Uh, Hold Tight by Dave D. Dozy, Beaky Mick and Titch. Um, Happy Talk. Oh, that's Happy Talk. That's a bit contrived, but well done. Smooth by Santana. Excellent. Dana Rawson and the Supremes. Very good. (laughs) Anything by Slipknot, All You Need Is Lube, Slip Sliding Away, <laughs> Everything I Lube, <laughs> Everything oh, I Lube, I Lube It For You by Brian Adams. <laughs> we, we, we've got Gecko and the Bunny Men, and someone mm-hmm. upgraded that to Gecko and the Honey Men. Well done. Um, we've got the, the Velcro Underground, <laughs> KY and the Sunshine Band. Very good. Uh, let's see, Stuck in the Middle With You. Uh, we've got Mew Order, very good. Glue Moon, uh, which was excellent, but my personal favourite is UBWD40. Fantastic, oh, yeah. whoever that was. Absolute winner. Okay, so give yourselves a round of applause yeah, in the Twitch well, chat for that. That's pretty good, Laurie, right? I hope you were impressed. Real impressed. Okay, real let's impressed. get on. Let's get on to the serious stuff now. Okay, so um, I'm going to hit you hard with a hard hitting question first, Laurie. Right. Do you have a pet and can we see it? I don't have a pet. I am sorry to disappoint. Um, but in the absence of a pet, I'll show you a thing that's on my desk. And that is, I'm, I'm a huge Prince fan. Okay. So um, a friend of mine made this crochet Prince in all his purple glory with studs and everything. So he's kind of, he sits on my desk beside me. So I, I'm not as good as a pet. I get it, but... It'll do, I think. That is absolutely the next best thing, and I'm sure you stroke it. You stroke prints on a regular basis. I do. I do. <laughs> okay, let's get on to uh, the questions. This one from definitely not Igor. Um, what has the lowest coefficient of friction that we know of? Is there likely to be something that is lower? Yeah, real good question. Definitely not Igor. Um, the thing about the coefficient of friction is that it's always defined between two things so i can't say that a material has the lowest coefficient of friction but i can tell you what the lowest coefficient of friction is between two materials right so the one of well definitely the lowest one that we are 100 percent sure of is the coefficient of friction between teflon on teflon right and that coefficient is about 0.04 Right. And if you think about the coefficient of steel on or we talked about, like, you know, the sliding on the sand, 0.3, 0.5, rubber on asphalt is about 0.9. So a coefficient of friction of 0.04 is pretty small. So Teflon really is ultra, ultra slippery. Um, Will there likely to be anything uh, smaller than that? There is there is another material that's called BAM. Right. So it's. It's um, it, it's like not it's a composite, but it's kind of got aluminium, magnesium, titanium dibromide, I think. And it's if you have two pieces of BAM and you slide them along one another, you get a mu of about half of that of Teflon on Teflon. Um, and there are some what we call diamond-like carbon films, so particular types of carbon with its particular molecular structure, and um, that also has lower coefficients of friction. But those materials are incredibly expensive to make, and they're not particularly versatile. So from a kind of a practical viewpoint, Teflon is really the the lowest friction material that we have in our daily lives. Teflon's the one. I know you go into a little bit of detail, and and, and I, I love the gecko um, chapter probably the most. Mm. And I'm listening to this during my my morning jog, thinking, I wonder if I I wonder if a gecko could stick on to Teflon, you know? And then you find out, okay, well, people have been playing around with that, and you know, yeah. there's there's all sorts of fun and not so fun experiments being done with geckos right yeah it's true the gecko the poor gecko i mean because it's so it's such an interesting lizard anyway it has been studied for such a long time and yeah you know as is often the case the nazis got a hold of the poor gecko and some of the experimental procedures were not nice uh they're really horrible actually um but in more recent years you know, we've had a lot more control over, you know, how animals are treated in, in research. And some of my favorite experiments have been where they put like a, a tiny harness <laughs> on a gecko and make it walk across surfaces so they can measure the forces. And that's, you know, th- there's no 
there's no mistreatment there of the animals. They're really well looked after. Um, there are some as well where people have managed to take. So a, a gecko's foot has what we call a hierarchical structure. So it's got bigger features and then smaller features and smaller features and smaller features. And the combination of all of them is what allows them to climb. But there are hairs called setae on geckos. And there are researchers who've managed to find ways to remove a single hair and measure, do experiments on that. So again, that's a lot less, you know, damaging or worry, worrisome for from an animal rights point of view where it's just like taking a hair off our head and then doing experiments on that so but yeah the gecko one was a real fun it was a real fun one to look into because I, I don't think I'd realized how long we've been studying them you know to be honest so that's why it ended up being a whole chapter rather than the gecko just being one animal of many you know it was a mind blow yeah don't pluck your geckos at home please people don't <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, next question. This one is from Igor. Okay, are we at the, are we at the top of our lubrication game? Did we achieve the best possible slippiness and waiting for superconductor levitation, mm. or can we squeeze some more? We can definitely squeeze some more. Um, what was really interesting to me, and I had not realised this, um, is that we really aren't very. We're, we're pretty basic in our approach to lubrication design. You know, even though in many other aspects of materials research, we can, we you know, people are modeling non-existent materials in computers because our supercomputers are so much better. So you can actually kind of design an experiment from, or excuse me, design a material from individual atoms and test it in a model and then go, okay, that will work for whatever my purpose is. Now I can make it. We, that hasn't happened with lubrication. Like we are still very much, you know, the big oil companies mostly um, take all of these different compounds and they mix them together and they they vary the viscosity um, and they vary, you know, they'll design it so that it does really well in very high or very low temperature environments but it's real kind of you know it's it's real bucket and shovel kind of science it's really not very scientific now with the dry lubricants so I kind of hinted at with molybdenum disulfide um, one of the researchers who I talked to there she's looking at it really purely from an atomic point of view. So she's really, really fundamentally trying to understand what is going on when you have a few atomic layers of these potential dry lubricants. So that could be graphene, for example, is one that acts as a lubricant on the nanoscale. Um, or molybdenum disulfide is the other big one. But these layered, these 2D layered materials where we now have the ability and the the ability to look at and produce and to study individual atomic layers, that is starting to change the game with lubricants because we're, instead of looking at it like, what's the viscosity and you know flow behaviours that I want? We're like, what's happening down here at the nanoscale and how can I design it from the bottom up rather than the application down? So I, I reckon that we're going to see some we're going to see big, big leaps forward in lubricants, particularly these kind of interesting dry lubricants in the years to come. Um, yeah. Is is there not a difficulty there if you're doing it from the bottom up? Whereas, okay, well, we found some we found some interesting theoretical things that are that are happening at this atomic, you know, subatomic yeah. level, or whatever, right? The, but then it's like, well, that's of minimal use because we can't we can't scale it up, right? And and you know yeah. maybe, maybe that's the same the same discussion with Teflon and bam. Yeah. Who named it BAM, by the way? Was it one of the Flintstones? Um, That's really cool. <laughs> I think it was a load of German researchers, I think, at PTB, I think, if I'm right. Um, a big research lab in Germany called PTB. Shortest word in the entire uh, German vocabulary. There you go. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that, Germany. Okay. Um, so, but, like, you know, uh, how, uh, is it not, like, mostly driven by... Like potential commercial um, gain at the end of it, and maybe that's what's kind of stymieing the, the the sort of really kind of detailed study. Or yeah, for sure. Like so, we lose so much energy to friction. Um, and that's what motivates the production of lubricants. Like that's just the simple truth, and that's why the oil industry is they invest so much money in it and 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 really why we sometimes see quite a bit of greenwashing from the uh, oil companies because they'll talk about oh but we produce all these low friction compounds and these incredible lubricants to help you save energy and they reduce your fuel usage that's all true that's all accurate but obviously they're doing that because they also produce the fuel that powers the the machine so it, it, there's a little bit of kind of 
interesting questions around that um, because we do really need lubricants you know we really we really do we can save massive amounts of energy we really can improve environmental footprint of transport for example if we use lubricants but right now they're all of the all of the development is done by basically the big chemical companies and the big oil companies so um and that is what drives it right it's money can we save money? Is it? Can we reduce the amount of fuel that my boat uses when I'm shipping my stuff across the planet? Yeah, okay, right, well, we'll pay for it. Um, the nano stuff is much harder to scale up, but it it's more that in, in asking the questions about what's actually going on, we could potentially design better bulk scale lubricants. Or in some cases, we might actually, in theory, we might actually be able to do away with some liquid lubricants in mm. favour of these of these dry lubricants, which, although they're interesting on the nanoscale, they operate on the bulk scale. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it, is, it is always tricky with this stuff. But I do feel like the fact that a lot of the control is in the, is in the hands of big oil companies is, well, problematic, shall we say. <laughs> I think, you, I think you just ruined your chances of a paycheck from big oil. By the way, well, you know, some you know of what? In my in my last book, I was told there was a there was a review left that said that I was a, uh, a shill, a shill. For, for big oil, and I was like, "Did you read the book?" <laughs> I was like, "No, I'm not. I would be a lot richer, I think, if I was." <laughs> Probably, if you you do, you're not doing something right if you don't get accused of being a show for something. Okay, right. let's move on. This next question is from Parrot Lady. Did the experiment with oil as well, or just with water? And this is the Egyptian slide experiment. Very good question. Um, I did ask the scientists this, and I also asked them if they used fresh water and salt water, um, in case there was a difference. And they used fresh water, um, and their logic was like, you've got the Nile that's running through Egypt, so they would have had easy access to fresh water. Um, they they did not do the experiment with oil. It would be interesting to see if they did, because there are loads of examples in this period of Egyptian history where oil was used. Um, Again, it's it's not it's not very clear as to what precise oil is being used, and every oil has its own kind of lubricating properties. So they chose water because they felt it was the most likely thing that they were using, and it just ended up that the numbers kind of reflected that that it, it was a possibility that it was it was water at least. So they didn't do oil, but it was purely because they they felt like it would be like you said, it's a very expensive approach. So probably the Egyptians would use something cheaper. Yeah, I would, in in the in the volumes they were doing those movements, yeah. at, it would have to be something that they can produce quite easily. So you know, yeah. all right, water, but may, may, maybe there was a chance they could mix things in the water, like squint yeah. plants into it or whatever. Who knows? Absolutely. Right? Who knows? Absolutely. And I mean, we know that they are incredible engineers. So I wouldn't put anything past them in terms of their their really in depth knowledge of, of these materials. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if if actually they had invented entire lubricants for this. Okay, so folks, next time you're at the beach, do not pour oil in the sand. That will be frowned on. Mm -mm. You'll get slapped about by Greenpeace. Okay, next question by definitely not Igor. Um, could a plane <laughs> on a treadmill moving at the same speed in the opposite direction take off? just because of friction? I think no is the answer to that. Um, mass is what's limiting you in this situation. Friction is a, is a problem. Um, and we do get skin friction. It's something that aircrafts have to deal with a lot, as well as form drag, which is the shape of the aircraft. Um, yeah, I think probably not. If you've got something much lighter, maybe. Maybe a glider. Maybe you could get a glider to, to take off. Um, but not, it wouldn't just be due to friction. It would be to do with aerodynamics in general, you know, lift more so than friction. Okay. All right. Um, don't try that at home, kids. Right. Uh, next question <laughs> from Igor. Surprisingly, Igor. What will happen to, well, everything if friction suddenly disappears? How many seconds will we have to live? Oh, man, that's a hard question, Igor. Um. The thing about friction is that it only operates where two things meet, right? So we would fall over instantly for a start if we if we could no longer generate friction force between our feet and the ground. Um, most things around us aren't actually held together by friction. Um, you know, friction might be used initially, like 
it might be used initially to kind of make an initial contact but usually there's you know I'm just looking at my house around me you know it's held together with nails it's a wooden a wooden house it's held together with nails and screws and bolts so that it all stay there um mechanical systems though if it disappeared entirely I don't actually know what would happen I guess a lot of things would literally fall apart um because you would have no longer resistive forces that maybe we'd have perpetual motion <laughs> um who knows but i don't know i don't think it would have much of an impact on our ability to live as far as i know anyway just a lot of falling over so it'd be funny a lot of falling over it would definitely be funny briefly and then before you start panicking yeah. um but the thing about friction is like the word is a funny one um because it's kind of, it's really it's really like an umbrella term for loads of different interactions yeah. and there's there's you know it's re- there's really lots it's very hard to say what is friction and that's why I wrote a whole freaking book about it but um because there's so many different versions of it or at least there's so many ways that we can use the same word that kind of explains what's happening between and the interaction between surfaces um but like what's happening on the bulk scale when we think of friction there you know we think of something like rubbing our hands together to generate heat right that's a frictional interaction but actually our understanding of what friction is when we're just talking about a few atoms is quite different um they're the same thing and like the stick slip friction that i mentioned and i'm sorry that the um you guys couldn't hear the violin video um, but i'll share a link to it um but the, the stick slip friction, that exists between atoms. We've measured this intermittent motion between atomically flat surfaces. Obviously, it operates on a violin scale and it mm-hmm. operates at tectonic plates. But it's not the same fundamental mechanism that is defining all of that behaviour. It's just that that's the same outcome and we just call it friction. So it's really hard to say when we remove all friction. It's hard to answer. Sorry, as a cop-out answer. But <laughs> good, good thought, it's terminal. Like, no, no need to send a violin, but so uh, dear dear viewers have you ever heard the violin before that's what it sounded like congratulations yeah. right uh, yeah okay. what happens is that no rosin you don't hear any vibrations you don't hear any sound at all um once you put the rosin on you actually hear the sound so it is really important yeah okay uh a question from anonymous uh that's not genuinely anonymous laurie it's, it's not like some smoky hidden figure it's just <laughs> too lazy to write a name uh when giving questions um how do maglev trains work with the friction thing? Um, friction's not really an issue for maglev trains, to be frank. Not on, not in terms of the interaction between the, the train and the, the rail that it is kind of hovering around. So it's not um, making contact, right? So it's, yeah, it's not making just contact. air friction really... as it moves through the air then, right? Exactly. And that's why, and the thing about like um, normal trains is the friction between the steel wheels and the steel rail it is what allows trains to keep moving but it also puts a, a one one of the reasons that we have a hard limit as to how fast a normal train can go and uh, moving through the air is the other thing so yeah the friction with the air is what slows it down but like with maglev trains you know they're really engineered to be as sleek as possible just to try and eke out try and reduce that that air friction just that drag just ever so slightly because then there's no friction actually there's no contact between it and the rail so the friction there is non-existent and then the friction is reduced by by tapering the shape of it um yeah, yeah. but yeah there's i mean there's there's, there's friction within the, its components but not not between it and the rail and for more information about aerodynamics and such like uh check out laurie's book <laughs> chuck yeager chapter a stormer i love that <laughs> Thank uh, you. okay most railways used uh, sorry this is from puffer nutter um, name. Good, good name. Well done, Popper. Yeah. Uh, most railways use wheels with steel tires on steel rails. Absolutely. Is different magic happening there? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's just it's kind of bog standard friction, to be honest. Um, and what's interesting between the steel wheel and the steel rails, what they're trying to do is they're trying to match the material so that they get a really consistent value of friction. Because what you don't want in most environments is friction that's really, really high or really, really low. Okay, that's obvious. But you also don't want friction that changes too much throughout the throughout the interaction, like whether it's a train moving on a rail or you don't want a sudden change in friction that causes complications. So they use those materials because they're super robust. They're relatively cheap to produce. They do well outdoors. And because they're effectively the same type of steel, not entirely, but they get a really consistent value of, the co- of friction between between them. So it is actually friction. It is generating friction between the two. But something that can interrupt that is 
if you've ever heard like, oh, there's delays on the train because there are leaves on the line. That's a real thing, right? That is like, I mocked it the first few times I heard it. You know, Irish woman moved to London, the all was bloody being told in the autumn about leaves on the line. But what actually happens is that those leaves get squished in between the heavy train and the steel rail. And it the leaves actually produce a very waxy, very low friction surface. And, it, and it's very hard because it gets compressed and it gets warmed up by the friction between the wheel and the rail. So that really does dramatically decrease the friction between the wheel and the rail. And the train, the wheel then the wheel can't actually get a grip on the wheel on the rail excuse me to get moving um so it is kind of bog standard friction but we they do have to manage um very very unexpected or you know very annoying uh, low friction moments particularly in the autumn and then of course in the winter if ice can form that also reduces the friction between them yeah, yeah. the train the trains have tires i'm not sure that last question was appropriate excuse no me. no it's good it's they, call wheels, tires. Right? they call okay. them tires they call them tires yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. We've got uh, at 66 Steve in Ireland. Um, how large a part is friction in drag from air? Are there any interesting directions opening up with respect to air friction? Uh, that's asking again for maglevs and cyclists. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a lot easier to move through the air than it is through a liquid, right? That's kind of obvious, I suppose. But but air is still, there is air still does exert a force on you, you know, and it is genuinely harder to move through a headwind than it is through still air. So air friction is is a very big thing. And anything that moves through the air has considered the friction between the, the friction it's experiencing on its surface. Um, so, yeah, that's why planes are the shape they are. It's why cars are the shape they are. Um, it's why, you know, superstar cyclists, especially the ones who race on the oval, it's not even called an oval, not a cyclist, can you tell? You know what I mean, those things. Um, they wear like these kind of really sleek helmets and they have these really tight suits on. All of that is about reducing form drag. They want to make themselves as small and as aerodynamic as possible so that all of the airflow around it is as smooth, that be- around them is as smooth and not turbulent as possible. Once you get turbulence in the mix, Sometimes you can benefit from that, um, as we see with golf balls. Like golf balls travel further than because they're dimples than they do if they're smooth, because they actually kind of use turbulence. Um, but usually, what you're trying to do is keep the airflow as smooth as possible to reduce the the friction between you and the air. Um, the other half of the question was like, is there anything new happening, or is there any interesting stuff? Um, Yes and no. Uh, there are. There's more really to do with reducing drag in hydrodynamics, so reducing drag in the water. There's a lot more being done in that space um, than I could find, certainly, that's being done. And, and by being done, I really mean dicking about with the surfaces, like changing the structure and the shapes and the chemistry of the surfaces to try and reduce the friction. And um, most of that is kind of been most of the interesting stuff excuse me, I think it's being done for hydrodynamics rather than aerodynamics. But, you know, we managed to break the sand barrier, right? So I think we've done pretty well. And also, you know, we've got spacecraft returning from other places um, that are traveling at many, many, many times the speed of sound. And we have managed to create materials and to design spacecraft to to tap into that friction to keep them safe. What we do what we would not want is for a returning spacecraft to plummet through the air without friction it needs that friction to slow down um so yeah there's nothing kind of i didn't come across anything or at least i can't immediately think of anything particularly interesting in terms of manipulating air friction but certainly fluids yeah certainly liquids all right thank you uh okay back to igor again (laughs) is it possible to create some kind of gecko gloves that will work for humans or are we too (laughs) big and fat for that no, we are not too big and fat for that. We um we can we can have gecko gloves. Um, I there's a I'm gonna try and see if I can remember the guy's name now. Um, oh no, I've totally forgotten what it is. I'll think of it. It'll come to me. Um, there is a researcher who, when he was at Stanford, uh, Elliot. Anyway, I'll think of it. Um, who was a, a, a researcher at Stanford, and I talked to the team at Stanford there who developed this gecko. A, gecko tape they call it like it's a gecko based gecko inspired kind of adhesive really what it is is strips of silicone that have tiny wedges in it so 
when a gecko's foot gets in contact with the wall, um, I mentioned earlier that there's these tiny hairs all over it. I won't go into all the details, but what they do is they put the foot against the wall and then they tug it down slightly. And that causes those hairs to splay out and make really intimate contact with the wall. And that's how they can climb. And by changing the angle of their toes, they can also switch off their, their stickiness just by changing the angle of the hairs. So kind of going from that, these Stanford engineers designed these silicon strips with wedges on them, tiny wedges that also splay out when they're tugged down. Oh, Elliot Hawks. Yes, Elliot Hawks. Thank you, David. Um, so there's a video on YouTube of Elliot Hawks using these gecko tapes on these really beautifully designed um, hand kind of, they have little strips of tape along different parts of the fingers. And then there's these tendons that are connected to it like a proper glove um, attached to these stepper platforms. So there's his feet are on the platforms and as he lifts his as he lifts one hand, his foot moves with it and tugs it down. And they get some gecko inspired adhesion. And he managed to climb up a, a glass building. Um and I think it was like on the Daily Show or something. It ended up being really popular in the US. Um so yeah, that they have been designed, but the same technology is also properly being used in factories as a way to kind of grip onto quite awkwardly shaped objects. Um, you get a really good contact using these kind of gecko fingers. And they're also being used in the space industry to manipulate things that would otherwise require clamps or, you know, kind of the, what they want to always avoid in space is anything kind of sticky and viscous um, mm -hmm. because those materials tend to produce lots of volatiles. They tend to outgas, uh, which is a problem. Um, so these gecko grippers, they don't have any sort of special coating on them. They don't need any air pressure. They can just hold on to surfaces. So they're also being used on the ISS right now, in fact. When can we buy them? Um, you can buy them now if you go to, I think they're called... On Robot, there's a commercial company who can produce them, um, but they're still quite big and chunky. I don't think we can put them onto our wrists and and go. Not yet, anyway. Okay, right. Somebody I'm sorry. find that. Somebody find that and get the get the link into Twitch <laughs> chat, please. I'm going shopping after this. All right. Uh, okay. A uh, question from Grimbeard: How do they get non-stick coatings, e.g., Teflon, to stick to things? Great question. Yeah, Teflon um, is basically a really long backbone of carbon surrounded by fluorine atoms. And the reason it's so nonstick is because the bond between carbon and fluorine is like one of the strongest bonds that exists in chemistry. Nothing else can kind of attract Teflon that cannot pull Teflon apart, really. It takes a lot of work. So now I had a look at this and I, I was looking for at a specific kind of pan frying pan manufacturer and I couldn't find out particularly what they do. But from looking around, there's kind of two main options. One is that you take whatever your base material is. So in the case of a frying pan, it's probably aluminium or something like that. And you roughen it. And by roughening it, I mean you sandblast it, you stick it in an acid bath, um, you do anything you can to really, really roughen Shoot up the surface. insults at it. Yeah, exactly. Be it, yeah, exactly. Be horrible to it. Anything that will cause it crumble somewhat. And we, you know, we know how to do that to metals. We've done that for a long time. Because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to cover it in rough 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 patches and maybe even cause some cracks and holes to form because then what you can do is you can spray a very thin coating of teflon on top of that and although it doesn't make any chemical bond it just literally gets stuck so it just gets stuck in the places all the gaps and all the crevices and all the holes um so and then you bake it to let it solidify so it's kind of not it's not actually adhered to the uh, aluminium. It's just kind of caught in all of the gaps. And then once you get that first thin layer stuck on, then you can just spray other coatings of Teflon on top of that because it's now just sticking to Teflon. So that's like one, that's I think probably what they do most of the time because that's pretty cheap and pretty easy to do. And um, the other option is that you can absolutely bombard Teflon with high energy ions basically blast the crap out of it and try and rip apart those carbon fluorine bonds and if you do that then you're left with a carbon that's going hey and basically everything wants to stick to carbon so that's how you can get something else to stick to it but that feels like a very expensive very a big waste of energy way to do it i suspect it's the kind of mechanical approach that they use mostly all right think about that next time you're doing a fry mm. uh okay Back to Grimbeard again. What is the stickiest substance in the world and why do Weatherspoons use it for their carpet? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man, yeah, it's been a while since I've been in a Weatherspoons, but I still remember that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I actually don't know the answers to this question, and that's I'm not doing a cop out in this one. Um, it's partly because it's really hard to define what stickiness means. It's not actually, it's not actually a metric, right? It's not like density. What's the density of this material? What's the densest material on the planet? That that probably is measured and known, but we don't we don't really. To define something as sticky is is quite an odd one because it doesn't really have any scientific meaning. Um, mm. But I guess you know one a lot of very viscous fluids, like we we kind of briefly mentioned honey earlier. Um, a lot of very viscous fluids tend to also be sticky. They tend to also react with oxygen or water in the air when they're put onto a surface. So they often will be sticky in terms of. Um, the amount of internal friction that exists between them. So there are scales of viscosity. Um, I don't know what the most viscous liquid is, but like, you know, you've got kind of water, maybe olive oil, honey, ketchup. Ketchup is quite a viscous, surprisingly viscous fluid. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know how to answer that one, I'm afraid. Sorry. I guess it depends what you're trying to stick to, to what as well. Yeah, right? you know, that's true. Yeah. You know, Adhes- adhesion, they say, is like a property of the system. It's a real like, scientist thing that loads of scientists told me. And what it really means is that it's hard to define its properties in isolation. You'd have to think about how it's being used and what it's trying to do. OK, good. You talked your way out of that. I'm not going to accuse Thanks. you of copying out. That's fine. All right. Um, from Grey the Earthling, do other solids become slippery near their melting temperature or are water's bonds unusually weak or is water unusual in some other way? Great question. Water is unusual. Um, it is particularly complicated and we kind of know that because usually when um, things, when a liquid solidifies, it gets more dense, but that's not true with water. When water freezes, it becomes less dense. So water is weird. It has its own weirdnesses. Um, but what was interesting was like this pre-melting layer, it exists on most solids, which kind of leaves you with that slightly icky feeling that you are in a world in which every surface is ever so slightly moist, which is kind of gross. Um, so, yeah, it does happen. It does happen on a lot of solids. The All that differs really is the thickness of the liquid layer. Um, so it will be different thicknesses, but, but usually but always much, much too small to see with the naked eye. Um, Bef- you know, before it actually begins to melt. So yeah, it is actually a lot of solids, which I did not know about before. I looked oh. into this. Okay, it's well that's down. creepy. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's not end on that one. We've got yeah. we've got a good question <laughs> to end with, and it's only appropriate that it's from Igor. Um, so Laurie, last question. This one, make it a good answer, please. Oh, what yeah. is your oh, no. favourite way no. that people are using friction to their oh, advantage? <laughs> So, Igor, do you want me to say where we have loads of friction or can I say where we're manipulating it and trying to reduce friction? I'm going to do the latter. Well, look, I mean, it could just be just just getting the right amount of friction, surely, right? Yeah. It's not about highs or lows. It's about that. No, you're right. It's about consistency. It's about getting a good amount of grip (laughs) for whatever your particular need is. Um, Oh, man. I don't know. This is a really hard one. I think... I'm going to I'm going to go with something cool that I didn't know about which is how we how we make surfaces very slippery right um there's a particular plant called the salvinia fern which is a weed actually and it's, you don't usually you're not usually happy to see it when you see it because it tends to be quite invasive but what's really interesting about it is it's incredibly hydrophobic. You can submerge it in water for literally decades and you can pull a piece of it out of the water and it will be bone dry. And I think that's really interesting. It's kind of like the lotus effect. Some of your people there will know, will have heard of the lotus effect, but it's actually even better at repelling water. Um, And what they realized uh, when scientists started looking into this a few years ago is that um, when you get a salvinia fern and it's covered in lots of hairs, all of that is hydrophobic, right? It repels water. It's waxy. It repels water. But at the very tips of each hair, there's actually a tiny blob that is hydrophilic. It attracts water. So what happens is when you put this plant into the water, water is attracted to the very tip, but that traps a layer of air underneath it. So it's unbelievably hydrophobic and some stuff that I've seen that's been done on this is trying to use this to design coatings for boats where we could potentially design boats that never get wet like boats that do not sit in the water they sit on a cushion of air in the water and I feel like that is such a freaking cool thing and 
like 90% of global trade happens by ocean, 90%, like even in the time of flights. Um, so if we could find a way to reduce the friction that a, a massive, you know, uh, carrier ship uh, experiences as it moves through the water, that would hugely decrease its environmental footprint and we could feel less guilty about buying stuff from overseas. So, yeah, that's one of my favourites and something that I'm really, really keen to keep an eye on in the coming years. OK, I think that's a perfect answer. And you didn't, you resisted the temptation to to, to move into filthy territory. And I'm I, sorry. I applaud you for that, but... Good. If if anybody else wants to move into filthy territory, I'll be in one of the breakout rooms on a in the Lockins Razor later on in Zoom. Um, I can talk you through all sorts of stuff. Guys. So you know, hit me up. <laughs> yeah, Laurie, um, we're out of time, but thank you so much. Just just in case anybody wants to hear more from you, where should they go? Um, my website's lauriewinkless.com, and I'm always, literally, always on bloody Twitter. So I'm Laurie underscore Winkless there. All right, Laurie, thanks again. Oh, so, don't forget to use the discount code, guys. Okay, yes, don't absolutely. Buy, don't I'm sure they'll be throwing that if you're in the UK. And by the way, this isn't just like, oh, Brexit bonus, okay? It's just because of Brexit that we can't offer it wider, okay? So just in, in case there's any any Weatherspoons patrons in the audience tonight, uh, you know, don't, don't get overexcited, okay? So, um, folks, that brings us to the end this evening. But as I said, we will be opening up the lock-ins razor on Zoom in not too long again. The mods will be putting the link into the chat for that. I do want to thank the other folks that, that that helped make us run tonight. So we've got David and Igor in the techie area and James being the wind beneath my wings helping me out as backup MC and managing the questions and stuff. Remember, um, all of our, or just about all of our previous talks are available on YouTube. If you want to relive the magic that we've had with Laurie tonight, it'll probably be online in a couple of days' time. Just look out for us on, on the socials. Um, our next talk is on the 10th of February. It is a Modern Humanism in Africa with Kato Mukasa. So that's uh, 10th of February, not now, Kato. So, again, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your night. Um, ego out. See you on the other side.